The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion is the second installment in the Elder Scrolls franchise, at least that anyone else actually seems to care about. Despite not having the grand legacy that Skyrim has had and will continue to have until Skyrim 2 comes out, Oblivion still has a surprising amount of people playing it to this day. It's not exactly Skyrim numbers, but it's significantly more than some other Bethesda published games that came out in 2019. While being a large enough game in and of itself, its longevity comes from its mods, because vanilla content is never really enough for very long, as I'm sure many people's search histories would indicate. If what you're searching for has more than three tags, get help. But imagine a world of official mods. Extra official content that you paid for, stick with me. Official content has much more tangibility than mods, more verisimilitude. And to that point, most people know Oblivion for its expansion packs, the Knights of the Nine, and the Shivering Isles, and absolutely nothing else. Thing is, Oblivion had a lot of official add-ons, but many people, myself included, never really had a chance to play them. All I did was desperately look at their listings on the UESP and think, yeah, spell tomes, that's the missing piece. If I had spell tomes, then maybe I'd be having fun with this game and not sitting alone in a dark room talking to a microphone. So to break the mind-numbing tedium of outgrowing a hobby, I'll be reviewing each and every one of the official add-ons for Oblivion. But for some much needed scope assignment, I'm not talking about the Shivering Isles or the Knights of the Nine, because firstly, they're much more like expansion packs, and secondly, most of you will have already played them and have your own opinions. You don't need mine as well. Knights of the Nine is okay, and Shivering Isles is good, but has some major flaws. But the main thing is we can all take solace in watching content regarding a thing we all know about. Man, how good was Who Done It? I'm not sure if they were ever meant to be bought as a package or if you just meant to actually pick out the ones you want. Because by their nature, not all of them suit every kind of playstyle, and a lot of people may only like playing through everything in the game with one character. It actually works a lot like a power supply unit being modular does. You can just put in what you want and then even with nothing, you still got a functioning... That... That's actually not a very good analogy, is it? So you have to make a choice. Do you maintain your roleplay and integrity, or do you sell out like the little piggy that you are and buy it all so that you don't miss out on any delicious morsel of content? One could understandably mistake an orrery for being a locked door that seems important, but you have no way of entering. No, your ex's DMs are not an orrery. But this is unfortunately just misinformation proliferated by the orrery included in Oblivion's Imperial Arcane University. Try saying that ten times quickly. It's not hard, it's just very embarrassing. For those that are unaware, an orrery is a mechanical model of the solar system that illustrates or predicts the relative positions and motions of the planets and moons, usually according to the heliocentric model. For those unaware, a heliocentric model pertains to heliocentrism, which is the astronomical model in which the Earth and planets revolve around the Sun at the center of the solar system. Historically, heliocentrism has opposed geocentrism. For those unaware, geocentrism is, despite having the name Imperial Orrery, much like any other feat of engineering within the Elder Scrolls universe, the Orrery is actually the creation of the Dwemer. It must be hard to have to slap your name onto something that someone else made that so many people seem to enjoy so much more vocally. By using console commands, you're actually able to enter into the locked orrery, but without the official plugin installed, you simply find yourself in this oversized room. Whether it strikes you as an Alice in Wonderland thing, or maybe some degenerate Vore thing, it's still a bit unsettling, isn't it? But thinking about it now, going through the halls of the towers in the Plains of Oblivion suddenly seems... Well, it seems a lot like... Uh, food for thought. So you're asked to complete a fairly straightforward quest of retrieving lost parts of the mechanisms that were stolen by bandits. The thing is, they aren't even located anywhere interesting, just bandit camps that there's a chance you've probably already come across in your adventures. Part of me was hoping that perhaps they could have made some small, unique dungeons to get the pieces from with a Dwemer coat of paint. Maybe they could just take some alien ruins and put a yellow filter over it and then, you know, slap in some of the Dwemer assets they had to make for the orrery itself, but that might be coming a little bit too close to actually justifying a price tag, and of course we wouldn't want that. The rewards of the orrery, other than some leveled amount of gold, is a daily power based on what day it is, and they all sort of seem just like participation trophies. 
Overall, in a roleplay sense, unless you were part of the Mage's Guild, you would have very little reason to want to fix the orrery, if you even knew about it in the first place. But my, my paladin character, despite being a warrior first and foremost, is naturally trained in restoration magic. So it makes perfect sense for her to be here and it's not just me shoehorning in a roleplay. So it, make, it makes sense. It's all good. On the theme of smaller magical based add-ons, we have the spell tomes. These magical books work much in the same way as those in Skyrim do. Some of them are actually pretty interesting in that they do add some unique spell effects and also give some spells that are more effective in a sense than those that you would have yourself, even if they do have potential drawbacks. Overall, they fit pretty seamlessly into the world, but ultimately the path of least resistance will probably rear its head here. Stealth Archer builds in Skyrim are a joke for a reason. They're incredibly easy to fall into and are very effective. Likewise here, the average player is much more likely to just use some basic damage over time elemental spells rather than any convoluted combination of cutting edge cantrips. Not dissimilar to the inclusion of skills like the ability to speak Centaurian in Daggerfall. It's, it's nice, but on average, like what average player is going to use that? Both of these add-ons technically fit well into Oblivion. Spell tomes for the obvious reasons, but the orrery only because it was a hole specifically made to be filled. In itself, it's interesting to look at, but one wouldn't likely return to it regularly. Consider the Elder Gleam Sanctuary in Skyrim, a location you go to for the Blessings of Nature's quest. It's a beautiful little area and a nice surprise to walk into while you're adventuring, but it's also just part of the game. It's a nice thing to remember, not something you read into because you had to pay to get through the door. Saying that the orrery naturally fits seamlessly into Oblivion is the same as saying that Fallout 76 fits seamlessly into the Fallout world. Just because someone left a door you couldn't get through in Fallout 3 as well. Nestled away, warm and snug in the Gerald Mountains, it's the Frostcrag Spire. A short trot through the snow from Bruma, or a quick click on the automatically given fast travel point because that sense of wonder and discovery in your fantasy RPG was becoming just a little bit too tedious. Finding a reason that my only slightly magically gifted paladin would come to own this abode would be pretty troublesome, but according to the quest update, this wizard's tower was left to you by its owner in its will because apparently you're distantly related. Wrapped that up in a neat little bow, didn't we? There's a journal inside explaining the events that led you owning this place. And these text-heavy exposition dumps are something that starts to become very common in all of these add-ons. But we'll tuck that little talking point away for when we run out of things to say for another add-on. Apparently, all the facilities of the tower were entrusted to the owner's trusted confidant, Orellan Way. Perhaps she, clearly a very important NPC character, would be able to shed some light onto this clearly deeply storied player home. Nothing I'd... Go ahead, please. Callendil runs a nice place at the Mystic Emporium. The most controversial part of this add-on is the inclusion of the additional altars of enchanting and spellmaking. If you're perhaps unaware, or you're suffering from trauma-induced amnesia, the only way to access these services was to join the Arcane University, which required you to do all the Mages Guild recommendations quests, which in turn were all particularly tedious. I'm afraid some things have happened while you've been gone, Associate. It may affect your recommendation. And if you have the audacity to say to me that the genius of the Mages Guild questline is that it's tedious and bureaucratic and shows the impotence of the arcane university then i'm gonna stop you because not only is taking the death of the author stance which is a coward's book club coup de gras but that stance is incorrect here and also they did it better in morrowind and that is the first and last time i'll ever utter that phrase frost craig spire is very mod-esque what i mean by that is it has this odd intangible quality that makes it one, not feel canon, and two, not feel in line with the general design philosophies of the game. Consider many player home mods that contain large sprawling estates, that while perhaps fit the character being played and may use assets from the game that fit aesthetically, they don't feel like a reward you would actually receive or something that would exist within the game world how it is portrayed. This doesn't stop them from being cool, but a lot of the time they just have these gimmicks and are generally very form over function. Having teleporters to each of the Mages Guilds is great, but I also hate the Mages Guild. So, and I think the most heinous thing to have in a player home is to be just slightly frustrating to get around. 
consider what is likely very many people's first player home in the game, the Imperial Waterfront Shack. It's small, has a surplus of easy to categorize storage and a bed. A veritable slum box. Only one loading screen and everything's within arm's reach. So having a Frostcrag Spire is great in theory, but at the end of the day, I'll be in my slum box. Also, I'll be using the Imperial Waterfront Shack. Battlehorn Castle is located far off in the distance and depths of the Colovian Highlands, just slightly left of Coral. A uh, Charol. Coral. According to the quest log, the defenders of Battlehorn Castle are besieged by marauders and are appealing for aid. And I, as a paladin, am not one to let an opportunity to help slip me by. As the newest master of the castle, I bid you welcome. Oh, and now I'm in charge of the cast. Wait, what? I'm not related to this guy too, am I? I mean, at least this Adam was clearly made for warrior characters, so I don't have to worry about the roleplay thing. But seemed a bit easy. I have to say, this place looks a lot like Castle Skingrad. Oh, wait, no, this is actually just Castle Skingrad. Battlehorn Castle does have lovely amenities, but the soulless thralls that inhabit the place seem to lack any fear of death. It's a lack of fear only present in those that know that you could never kill them in any way that mattered. All right. It has the same critical floor as Frostcrag Spire. It's a pain to get around. From the fast travel point to your quarters with 100 speed, athletics, zero weight, and loading from an SSD, it's still quite a trek. And further, if you pry deep enough, you might just find a secret passageway to a reanimated corpse of the castle's first lord and a lich. Say what you want about Slumbox, but at least it doesn't have skeletons in it. Anyone could be forgiven for walking right past the previous owner's corpse on the way in, as he is so unceremoniously crumpled in a pile of what I can only imagine is his own hubris. But last time I checked, hubris didn't smell like piss and shit. The Fighter Stronghold has plenty more written exposition, and spoken dialogue that might be specially recorded, but could just as well have been sutured together from other parts already in the game. This is indeed a dark day for all of us left. But I thank you for risking your own life to help us. It's odd because, as I said earlier, this add-on has this all-too-common mod idiosyncrasy of taking every single measure possible to avoid recording any unique dialogue. And I mean that it's probably quite expensive to do, and I'm sure it would have been quite a problem to get some young, cheap, hotshot voice actor trying to get out of the anime scene, because that would probably really clash with the audio aesthetic of the same 10, 50 year olds. As you can likely see now the recurring theme I was pointing out with these add-ons, I was curious as to what prompted their making. They had some unique assets, so it wasn't all just cobbled together from vanilla, but there was no real voice acting either. What was the budget? What were the designers briefed with? What resources and restrictions were in place? I was content to just speculate, but I decided to reach out to someone who may actually know. The problem is, most of the leads for Oblivion don't really seem to stay up to date on social media, but I did find one designer that had also answered questions regarding add-ons in the past. So I sent him a PM on Twitter, but he, he never replied. And you know what? I, I don't think I blame him, either. After all, I'm a literal who on the internet, and my opinion piece video essay on the DLC for a 13-year-old video game objectively does not matter. So for our next dalliance into the suspiciously free real estate market, ignoring the copious amounts of property tax that we're currently accruing, we have the Thieves' Den in Dunbarrow Cove. This is probably my favourite of the bunch, aesthetically speaking. I don't really have much interest in the nautical, the maritime, but I do enjoy the vibe of living in a cosy, hollowed out shell of people that have long since been forgotten. I imagine it's how my food feels. My point is, Dunbarrow Cove is really cosy, you know? Once you destroy all the restless skeletons haunting the place that I imagine are shackled here by dark magic and past regrets, you get rid of them, and you're actually looking at a pretty nice place. I made fun of this in regards to Frostcrag earlier, but the fast travel point here is almost a joke in itself. It's all the way out here. It's not even here or here. It's all the way back here. And then from here, you still have to enter the cove and then walk all the way through and over here just to get to your quarters. Let's do business. 
Once you start to buy the upgrades for the place, a gallimoffry of interesting rapscallions start to band together as your gang with you, the fearsome pirate leader at the helm. My valiant paladin, the pirate leader. But uh, that... No, 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 that makes sense because, yeah, 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 because at the, at the start of the game when you're in the prison, I, the, the, yeah, the reason my character was in the prison is because she was a thief, so she, yeah, and then that, yeah, so that, that makes sense. We don't have to ask you more questions, that's all good. Uh, look, all that matters is that the writing in this one is actually pretty good because you can really start to feel that camaraderie amongst you and your fellow rogues. I ran across a ghost once, seemed to suck the energy right out of me. On Cyrodiil's northern border is the sparsely populated mountain wilderness called the Valus Mountains. I'm not listening to you. It's because I don't like you. Just go away. Uh, well, I mean, if they won't tell us anything, at least we can read all the vol- Four volumes? Four. Four volumes of the previous Captain's Journal. Third Era. Year 286, or thereabouts. I'm finding it unlikely that anyone will be finding this journal, but if they do, know that here be written the last words of the great captain Toran Abdugal, scourge of the Abekian Sea, terror of the Gold Coast, cut bro- To round off our player home dally- I said dalliances in the last one, didn't- Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, vile lair, everyone. It's a spooky vampire and Dark Brotherhood themed lair for evil characters, I'm sure with a paradoxically comprehensive yet contrived backstory as to why the hell this Shadow the Hedgehog looking salt cave is apparently mine now. Honestly, this kind of aesthetic fits my righteous paladin perfectly because she, uh, uh sh she, uh, leave it with me, we'll come back to it. There's this unique Daedric dagger, by Oblivion standards, which is to say it looks the same as every other Daedric dagger, called the Crimson Eviscerator, just right next to the installation of the shrine dedicated to Sithis, the Harbinger of the Void. I mean, I keep my wallet next to the fruit bowl, so makes sense. Now, this is supposed to be a leveled item, which if you're not familiar, is a system in these games where special rewards have different variants based off your character's level. That means when you get them, you're not just handing a godly weapon of destruction to a level one character. That would be silly. That's like giving four free expansive player homes to, uh, to a level one character. The point is, unlike other quest rewards, the Crimson Eviscerator has its level decided the moment you exit the sewers at the start of the game, which is to say level one. And don't say that there's mods that fix that or the unofficial patch and that you can just uninstall the add-on and put it back in when you, no. All right, it should just work, you know? I will quickly, however, achieve Chim to give myself the max level one, because quite frankly, I think I deserve it. I do enjoy the notion of having to purchase the upgrades for this house for from someone who assumedly would have to come in and install them himself. Hey, thanks for helping lay out the finishing touches to my creepy shrine dedicated to a deity composed of primordial chaos. Really brings the room together. So... Uh... I'm at a loss for a reason as to why my character would have this house, and constantly shifting your roleplay to make it work is just kind of sad. It's behaving like you're some pathetic guy who seems content to take tiny little steps to become the person you think your ex would want to be with now, acquiescently molding yourself into someone that appeals to no one now because she hasn't even thought about you in months, man. It's 2020 now, are you still playing Oblivion? Just accept that you wanted to have the vampire house and that it doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, anyway, on the topic of intentionally targeted emotional appeals, we find ourselves at the last official add-on for Oblivion, Mayrune's Razor. The most influential callback to Morrowind since literally anyone ever made a YouTube video about it being better than Skyrim. This has to be my favourite add-on in terms of raw concept because ultimately it's just a long and challenging dungeon crawl. In my opinion, dungeon crawling is probably my favourite part of most RPGs, and ironically it's something that wasn't very well explored in Oblivion or Skyrim. 
Contextually, dungeons can be somewhat difficult to justify in a game world because the context of their existence is that they are labyrinths that are difficult to traverse and they have absurd puzzles and traps in them that protect the treasures within. Within a video game, they are essentially the architectural manifestations of a gameplay loop, and that in itself conjures enough suspension of disbelief in most cases to justify their existence. Whereas the ruins of Oblivion and Skyrim tend to be much smaller in scope and tend to amount to what is effectively running down a hallway with scissors. And that in itself provides a necessary distinction between what a ruin is and what a dungeon is. The alien ruins of Oblivion and the Nordic and Dwemer ruins of Skyrim serve as cultural snapshots to explore, but ultimately fail to provide that as they also feel like they need to subscribe to the design philosophy of what a dungeon is, which of course results in a pretty homogenous area. It may be controversial, but if you consider the Von Braun from System Shock 2 as a ruin of sorts, it provides a much better snapshot of this design philosophy. Not every area provides a meaningful challenge, but they all speak to the people that came before you. They paint a picture of how the people lived and don't make you question what this room says about their culture. In fact, let's play a quick game. What is the purpose of this room? I'm going to show you a room from an alien ruin, a Nordic ruin, a Dwemer ruin, and the Von Braun, and I want you to tell me which room has the most apparent purpose. Now if your response was, isn't this meant to be a review of Oblivion add-ons? And that is the correct answer. The rest of this add-on is very reminiscent of things from Morrowind, and not just because no one says anything and that there's no unique dialogue. In this preamble letter written on the old Oblivion download site that establishes the context of the add-on, it mentions King Helseth by name. <laughs> Wait a minute, you might ask. Isn't he that guy from Tribunal, the King of Morrowind, and he has that royal signet ring that makes him practically invulnerable unless you achieve Chim first? I mean, I mean, yeah. He you didn't have to list all the stuff from his wiki page. Like, I believe you if you say you know who he is. He's actually originally in Daggerfall, but I'd forgive you for not knowing that, as that game is tragically not very fun. So the main plot is that this rogue Telvanni wizard, Frathen Drothen, has amassed a mercenary army and has stormed into Cyrodiil to find Mayrune's razor. Now, we all know about the Telvanni, don't we? The wizarding great house of Morrowind, whose members seem a few Dwemer cogs short of an orrery. <laughs> And that would really explain why his army is so stupid. They're called the Droth Mary Army, the Droth clearly from Drothan, and Mary or Mer referring to elves. Seems a little egotistical to name an army after yourself. That would be like me calling you, my beloved viewers, Bianco's boys. It's a little too self-important, even if it is very catchy. They're all equipped with level heavy armor and their signature Droth Mary tunic. This dark elf army assembled and funded in Morrowind are all wearing their clearly Cyrodiilic and make tunics. They're not even unique shirts. Even this f idiot in the Imperial City has one. Everybody needs a copy of the Black Horse Courier. Have a copy of the Black Horse Courier. Oh, and the inclusion of a Morag Tog assassin was really a great throwback because the enigmatic and surprisingly legal assassination guild of Morrowind is a fan favorite. What? Be seeing you. My favorite part is how he's just wearing leather armor with a black hood that doesn't even match, even though there are brown hoods in the game that do match the leather armor. He has a writ of execution as well, which is the equivalent of Fire Emblem characters pretending that they love me. Honestly, I wish we could go on drinking tea like this forever. It's degenerate fan service. The point of the writ is to legally absolve yourself of the assassination it calls to perform. These are enforced throughout the Morrowind government and which would have no jurisdiction in Cyrodiil, one would imagine. And he clearly didn't just follow his target here from Morrowind because the high ups clearly knew that he he was the one, probably the ones who hired him and they knew Drothan was in Cyrodiil. I know the team who made this probably had like five days and $350 to put this all together. In my non-game development experience, it would have been nice to just have one piece of chitin armor for the full experience. And yeah, do you know it's actually chitin, not chitin. Even if all those Skyrim Dragonborn expansion pack videos say it otherwise. I only found that out in like senior biology. It's like coral and choral all over again. Even I had it wrong all these years. And I'm very, very smart, as you can tell by the fact that I use big words in my video essays talking about computer games. Anyway, Mayrune's Razor at its highest level variant is worse than the Crimson Eviscerator, which you get by doing nothing. So that's good. Oh, 
you may love, he's forgetting about horse armor. That's that's the bad add-on that everyone hates. <laughs> There's no jokes to be made here. It's all run dry years ago. This is all creatively bankrupt. And horse armor is pretty bad as well. I think the greatest joke of all I could possibly impart here isn't to write anything myself, but to just show you unedited gameplay footage of it, because it is a joke. So for all the jokes made over the years, if you've never seen it for yourself, here is the horse armor add-on for the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Snock Grabura, owner and proprietor. We board horses and, well, we don't actually sell horses. Anymore, that is. What can I interest you in? You've got to be kidding. Let's see what we've got here. <laughs> 